to give you a very warm welcome to our service this morning. It is a beautiful morning as well. It's good to see us all gathered out. As we come to worship the Lord this morning, let's remind ourselves of the character of the one who we approach in Psalm 25. Psalm 25, and I want to just read verses 8 to 10 of this passage. Psalm 25. And in verse 8 we read, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the, the, the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. You know, that reminds us that our God is good. He is just and he is righteous in all his ways. The one who calls sinners to himself and the one who wants us to walk in fellowship with him. His way is perfect and he never changes. Because it says here, his love, it is steadfast love. It's a steadfast and changing covenant love and he's faithful. So he's one who we can take at his word and even build our lives upon it. So that's what our first time reminds us of today of how we can rely on the promises of God and how also these promises find their fulfillment in Christ. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. And if you're able to, we'll stand as we sing this together, please.
Well, let's pray together and let's ask for God's help and blessing upon our service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks even for all that your word reveals about who you are. Lord, that you are good, that you are holy, and that you are righteous. And we want to give you thanks, Lord, for your steadfast, unchanging love towards us, your people. We want to thank you, Lord, even for your faithfulness. And Lord, even because of your your faithfulness and how even you've, as we see it in the pages of Scripture, how you've proven yourself over and over again to your people. Father, how that reminds us that whenever you promise something, whenever you make that uh, statement, Lord, we can rely on it. We can build our very lives upon upon it. But we want to thank you, Lord, for how even the promises of your word find their yes and amen in Christ. And through faith in him, that we can know comfort through even the storms of life, that we can draw hope from your word. But Father, we also, as this hymn has reminded us, we can find cleansing and liberty through Christ's sacrifice for us. And Father, through faith in Christ, we are united even to him as well. And Father, encourage us today, Lord, even from your word. Lord, bless us even through the, the fellowship even that we have together. And Lord, we do pray for each and every head by before us today. And for those also who are watching our services online. Lord, help them and help us in our worship. Lord, prepare our hearts for even your service. And Father, prepare our hearts even to receive your word of truth. And so, Lord, we commit not only this service into your hands, but also even this, this day before us. So, Lord, help us and be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let me just mention a few uh, announcements. You'll have already seen in the PowerPoint as uh, you're coming in just some of the the regular announcements. Uh, But let me draw your attention just to a few. Uh, First of all, don't forget tonight is our friends and family evening. And that's with uh, John Cunningham from Newry. And that's at 6.30. So again, the purpose of this night is so you can invite others even to, to come in as well. It's a bit more of an informal evening as well too because we have a couple of, uh, cup of tea as well after the service. And uh, I'd encourage you to invite friends, family, neighbors as well too. Uh, but just pray for John for this evening and pray also that others will accept the invitation even to come along and hear not only John's testimony, but he'll be bringing a short word just at the, at the end. Uh, and then uh, something else as well on Monday. Uh, so tomorrow is make and do as usual, but uh, there is uh, an invitation extended to all for tomorrow. And that's because, uh, as you know, it's coming up to the Queen's Jubilee. So there's a, a Jubilee tea party and make and do tomorrow. So uh, those who are available, I encourage you to come along to that. So that's in the, the hall up the stairs and that's at half ten. So, uh, and then the other thing as well, as well as our, our regular Tuesday night prayer and Bible study, also on Wednesday at 2.30 is Silver Threads, and the speaker at that is Fred uh, uh, Greenfield. So do pray even for that service as well too. And all these services are in the mind and will of God. We're going to, to sing uh, together once more. And again, if you're able to stand as we sing this, this is God Moves in a Mysterious Way. And we're going to sing this to the tune of, Oh God, Our Help in ages past. So let's stand if you're able and sing this together.
Well, just a few weeks ago, it was our association meetings, but uh, the college have put together a video which they're encouraging all the churches to show, uh, just to keep us up to date about the work that they're doing, but also to encourage us to pray for the work of the college too. So we're going to play that uh, video uh, just now, and then after that, uh, Terry's going to come up and also pray for the needs of the assembly as well too. But we're going to watch that video um, now, hopefully. <laughs> I want to thank you for the opportunity to share about the work of the Irish Baptist College. My name is Edwin Yurt. I've been serving as the principal of the college since 2010. IBC is not a standalone entity. It is one of the departments of the work of our association. We're the training department and we work alongside Baptist missions, Baptist youth and also uh, Baptist women. The college began life in 1892, at that time it was located in Dublin and then it was relocated to Belfast in 1964 and we currently occupy a building uh, purpose built here in Moira in County Down since 2003. We've got a very attractive modern building and that is very close to arterial uh, routes both from the north and the south of Ireland. Our flagship course that we offer is the Preparation for Ministry course uh, accredited by the University of Chester. For those seeking to enter ministry in all its aspects, then this is the pathway that we recommend you pursue. It is a course that is rigorously academic and also vocationally practical. Irish Baptist College students therefore do not simply gain an education, but they enjoy an experience. We also offer postgraduate courses and Christian education courses in the evening, both in person and online and in association with Baptist Women. We believe that the range of courses we offer means that almost everyone in our churches can have a suitable pathway in theological training. All of these courses are serving an overarching vision known as our 10-year vision. This vision was launched in the year 2017 with the goal of placing 70 gospel workers on the ground in that period. Since the launch, we have had over half of that number placed in gospel ministry. And this means uh, that we're most encouraged to see that we find ourselves on target for achieving the vision. One way in which we're able to make opportunities available for our graduates is the Ministry Partnership Scheme, through which to date we have placed over 20 of our graduates alongside an experienced worker to get further experience. In recent years, the college has embarked on some new initiatives, including special subjects, in which the college staff have made themselves available to tackle difficult questions. Also, elders and deacons training seminars have been offered focusing on the qualifications and offices of elder and deacon. And then in January each year, we have another new initiative and that is our Hugh D. Brown Lecture, in which an internationally renowned scholar addresses a topic of biblical and theological importance. All of this work, of course, needs to be uh, operated and facilitated, and that is done by our staff team. So please pray for us as we seek to train men and women for gospel ministry, both at home and abroad. Our student body is a good mix of genders, ages, experiences, church backgrounds and nationalities, and this greatly enriches our college environment. Please pray with us that the Lord will send a new generation of future leaders to train at IBC and go on to serve our churches and beyond. So what is our aim at the college? Our aim is simply to produce Christian leaders who will make an impact on our generation. So then, how can you pray for us? Well, the college not only appreciates your prayers, we actually depend on your prayerful support. And to this end, we have launched a new daily prayer diary entitled Pray Without Ceasing, which you can order from the Baptist Centre. It would be great, of course, if you not only supported the college prayerfully, but also financially. And you can do that uh, through one of our regular giving opportunities or maybe through a one-off donation. See our website for details of this. 
You can also get information on resources connected to the college through social media, the Insight magazine, and our Irish Baptist College podcast, which you can listen to online. Thank you very much for your attention, prayerful and financial interest. Please continue to support us as we train people for ministry in service of the church and for the glory of God. Thank you. Okay, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just, we just pray about the college and all the work that is contained therein. We just pray that you give wisdom as they come to the end of their term. And then, Lord, the new students coming in in September, we just pray that you will bring in the numbers of students that are required. Lord, we pray for the other parts of the, the Baptist Association. We pray of the missions. We pray that you will undertake, you will overrule, and you will be all that they need. Lord, we pray for Richard Donnan this morning, the new Baptist pastor in Hearts. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you that you have called Richard to this post, and we just pray that you'll be with him this morning as he leads the fellowship in Newton Art. We pray that you'll be on to him all that he requires in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for our own fellowship. Lord, you know there are those in our fellowship that are going through extremely difficult times health-wise. Lord, you know their needs. You know their needs better than any one of us know them. So, Lord, we just pray that at these very difficult times that your presence will be felt. Lord, you are there because you have promised to be there. But, Lord, sometimes we can be so low in spirit that it's hard to see it. So, Lord, I just pray for the whole fellowship, for the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual well-being. I pray that you will continue to guide us, strengthen us, Lord, you know our heart's desire is to have new families coming to join with us. So, Lord, we just ask that you will undertake and that you will overrule, that in your time and in your way, you will add to our number. But in that meantime, Lord, I pray that you'll just help us to remain true and faithful to what you have called us to do in your work in this part of the vineyard. So, Lord, be with us now as we continue on in our service, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Terry's already prayed for the work of the college there, but we are going to be praying for the college in uh, our midweek as well too. We'll remember some of those prayer points. Do pray for the students because a number of the students have uh, now finished their time at the college and are looking for even opportunities as well to, to minister. So please do pray for them. And also pray for the new intake because they, they will shortly be interviewing um, as well for new students started, uh, starting. And um, many of us have benefited from the work of the college, myself included. Um, but also, why not even think about one of those evening courses? Um, you can either attend there in person, or there is the online option available as well too. And I know many have, have benefited from those as well. So uh, something certainly to think about, but do pray for the work of the college before we turn to God's word, we're going to sing um, another hymn together. And this is one we haven't done, I think, for a little while, so I'm really hoping you just remember it. It's uh, a new hymn, uh, O Great God of Highest Heaven. So I'm hoping you do remember it. But if not, well, sure, you'll get the tune as we go along. Uh, but we'll stay seated just as we sing this together. Thank you. 
Something I should have mentioned as well during our announcements, if you're uh, wondering, keeping track of all those meetings, you can with our bulletin as well that's sitting down at the back, so please remember to lift one of those as well too. We're going to turn to God's Word, to the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29. I'll ask Henry if he could put up just the, the, the PowerPoint here. Jeremiah chapter 29. And just before we turn to that, I wonder if you've seen one of these before. Maybe, uh, hopefully you can make it out in the picture there, okay. But I remember my granny used to have one of these. It's a promise box or some one of the other ones you might see is one a little bit like this. Uh, But I remember being fascinated by this when I was younger. This wee box with all these little bits of paper on it. And then it even had these wee, wee tongs, you know, you could actually pick them up with as well. And maybe when I was younger, I have to admit, maybe I was more interested in just playing with the tongs and actually lifting them. But, do you know, as I, got to, as I began to grow older and I got to, to read and understand actually what this promise box was, was in each slip of paper, you found a promise of God. And the promises of God, they are so precious, aren't they? They're, because they're so encouraging and so helpful to us. In those times, maybe when we are struggling, in those times also when we are in need of encouragement, there's so many promises in scripture but the thing is whenever we take isolated verses out of context we have to be careful because we shouldn't take it out of the context that they're written and we need to make sure that we look at the verses around them as well to make sure we either don't wrongly try and apply promises which maybe weren't made for us or that we maybe make the promises maybe mean something that that it wasn't originally meant So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the original setting of one very famous promise today. And the purpose of this little series, it's a a mini-series, if you will, just to lead us up this summer, to give us some practical encouragement from God's Word to help us in our walk with God. So I've called it Precious Promises and Favourite Verses. So maybe if some of you even have favourite promises or verses, well, you never know if you have a wee word at the door, you might even hear them in the next few weeks as well too. But I have a few in mind in particular that I'm going to look at some favourite promises of many people. And some are going to be in the Old Testament, some are going to be in the New as well. But this one in many ways I think is an appropriate one for us to begin with. Because we've spent a bit of time in the book of Nehemiah and then the year before that in Ezra. So hopefully we'll be familiar with this, the setting of this. So some of this will be familiar to us and it's helpful time maybe to actually look at this one. So let's begin to read Jeremiah 29 beginning to read at verse 1. So uh, the, the exiles, this is a time given, this is actually before the exiles had returned. This is to the time when they were in Babylon and they'd literally just arrived. So this letter is given to encourage them. So chapter 29, verse 1. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And this was after King Jeconiah and the Queen Mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan and Gamara of Halkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And it said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into the exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord in its behalf. For in its welfare you will find welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill you my promise and bring you back to this place. And then here's this promise, which is greatly loved of many. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. 
plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart, and I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you in the exile. And may God bless the, the reading of his word together. You know, this is a verse, verse 11, which I'm sure is a favorite of many, maybe even many here, to know that God has plans for his people. But sometimes this is a verse which is often sometimes misunderstood. Because as people read this verse, they think, okay, well, God has, has good things in store for us. But then if we, we have that or take the verse just in surface value, what do we do when we face disappointments or trials then? How does this verse fit into that? This verse doesn't guarantee for us a life of plain sailing, no. Nor does it guarantee health and wealth. This is no prosperity gospel sermon, no. But this was a promise given to a particular group of people at a particular time. And as I say, it's key when we come across verses like this. There's nothing wrong, certainly, with memorizing these promises and drawing uh, great encouragement from them. But it's important that we understand the background to them because it helps us to, to rightly apply them in our lives. But As you come to this passage, it's a little bit like reading someone's meal. Because actually that's what we've just done. This is someone's meal. This was a letter which was sent to a group of people. And the letter begins really in verse 4. But imagine you uh, were walking down the street and you found a letter. You found a letter and maybe you're wondering, well, you know, I want to get this to the right person. You maybe open it. you You maybe look at who signed it at the bottom. You maybe look who it's been sent to. You maybe try and work out, well, you know, if, if you can't get details from that, well, what's, what's this letter about? And maybe that's a little bit like the feeling we're getting as you're looking at this, because we're jumping right into the middle of this today and this, and this promise. But let's consider, you know, the original setting of this. Firstly, who wrote it? Who wrote it? The writer here is the prophet Jeremiah, and we're told that at the very beginning in verse 1. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah prophet the prophet sent from Jerusalem. Now, Jeremiah was uh, primarily known as the weeping prophet. And the reason why he was known as the weeping prophet was because God had given him a particularly difficult message to proclaim to the people. God had raised him up to tell the people of God's judgment, to urge them to repent of their, their ways, to turn from their sin and to turn to God. And the judgment was that if they didn't do that, God was going to deliver them into the hands of the Babylonians. They were going to be taken away into exile. And of course, in the events of Ezra and Nehemiah, as we looked at them, we looked at what happened after uh, the exile. But this is is about 70 years before the time of uh, the book of Ezra. This was of the initial when they were about to go into exile. So at that time in Israel, there had been a whole series of kings. And some of the kings have been good, but there was a majority of them which were not so good. Because there was idolatry in the land of Israel at this time. King Ahaz even had gone so far as to, to even sacrifice children to the false god Molech. That's how far some of God's people had come. That's the sad state of their hearts. But yet there was good kings, kings like Hezekiah and Josiah, and they tried to even reform the people. But what had happened that ultimately, once their reforms came in, ultimately another king came in and sadly they started to slip back. So idolatry was creeping in to Israel. And what was happening was they were even still going along to the temple. But the issue was that they were worshipping the Lord outward only. Their hearts weren't truly right with God. And Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet because he was called to go to the people with this solemn message that God's going to judge you if you don't turn from your sin and turn to him. God's going to take you away, even into this time of exile. And not only was it idolatry, there was times of it, the people were even mistreating one another. There was injustice towards one another. 
People, uh, there's even, there was the, the judges, even in the, the justice in the land was even corrupt as well. So you get a real sad situation in the heart of the people. So he's called the weeping prophet because as he proclaimed this message, he actually didn't see the people repent. And we know, of course, they ended up in exile. Uh, who is it addressed to is the next question we want to look at. Well, again, the first couple of verses tell us this. The first three verses says this letter from uh, Jeremiah to the people who survived the exile, the elders, the priests, prophets, and the people who Nebuchadnezzar took. So they'd been taken away into exile. Also, don't forget this is uh, the events of the book of Daniel because uh, the king took the best and brightest young people of the land and he took them as well. So he, he was training them up for position in the palace. But the rest of the people were actually taken to, to live in uh, Babylon. So they were living away in a foreign land. And we'll talk about that in a wee while, what life was like there for them. But why is Jeremiah writing? What's he, why is he writing here? Well, he's writing to people who felt defeated. They'd lost their homes. They were now in a foreign land under a foreign king. And they thought that maybe somehow has God forgotten them? That's the question that was on their lips. They were wondering, had God forgotten them? Because here they were in that foreign land, they were God's people, and yet why had that happened to them? Of course, we know why it happened to them. It was because of their, their sin. See, the thing was, God was always faithful to the promises of the covenant that he'd made. And while he promised them blessing, if they walked in his ways and obeyed his commands, there was also a warning if they broke that covenant, there was going to be a punishment. And the punishment was these promises were being fulfilled, even in them being taken away. There was consequences for breaking that word. But God, in his grace, during that time, had sent them many prophets, prophets like Jeremiah, prophets like Isaiah, and yet the people refused to listen. You know, as they wondered with that question, had God forgotten them? You know, maybe sometimes, maybe sometimes you might be tempted to ask that question. Maybe if you've gone through a particularly difficult time, a particularly trying time, maybe a sudden prolonged period of illness, or maybe even the death of a loved one, you might be wondering, you know, has God forgotten me? If you're going through a circumstance which is so particularly trying. Maybe there's been another time where you've thought, is God hearing my prayer? You know, maybe you've been praying for a loved one who's not a Christian for many, many years. And maybe you're struggling with questions like that. Do you know, Jeremiah was writing to these people, struggling with these same questions. And he was writing to remind them of who God is and to remind them of actually they do have a hope. You see, there was another reason also why Jeremiah was writing this letter. And again, this is important whenever we look at the context of this. They actually really understand what's going on. You see, God had said they were going to go to Babylon, but actually there was other people who were saying, don't worry, it's all going to be fine. You see, in a couple of years, you'll be back home. In two years, you'll be back home. Look at chapter 28. Chapter 28, so the chapter just before this, we're introduced to a man called Hananiah in verse 1 of chapter 28. So this man, Hananiah, uh, he was a prophet from Gibeon, and he spoke in the house of the Lord. And, and in verses 2 to 3, he was saying, the Lord has told him that he's going to break this yoke of bondage that the king of Babylon has over them. So here they were in exile, in a strange place, a strange land, and Hananiah was saying, it's all going to be fine. You see, in two years' time, you're going to be back. And he says, not only that, but I'll bring the, all the vessels that were taken away from the temple. They're going to be come back too. Verse 4, I'll bring back the people. God's going to bring back the people. But this was completely contrary to what Jeremiah the prophet had said. If you're making notes, um, 20, uh, chapter 25, verse 11 is a pretty key verse here because Jeremiah 25, 11 says, Jeremiah had said to the people, this whole land, so talking about Jerusalem, is going to become a ruin and a waste and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So that was the word of the Lord that came from Jeremiah. And essentially Hananiah was coming along in chapter 28 
you know, and saying, no, that's, that's all going to be fine. Two years' time, it'll be all over. You'll be all right. And in chapter 28, verses 15 and 17, Jeremiah says to this man, Hananiah, you know, may God do that, but it's not going to happen when you says, but, but when God says, when God says, this is going to happen. See, he says, Hananiah, the Lord didn't send you. You've made this people believe a lie. And so the Lord will remove you. And God does remove Hananiah from the situation. So Jeremiah is writing to comfort, but also to correct these people. So what is he telling them here? First of all, notice who really speaks in this letter. It's not some just a letter from Jeremiah, but it's God who is speaking as well. Verse 4 of Jeremiah 29, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Thus says the Lord. This is God speaking to these people. And he's making very clear to them. Look, it's no accident that you're in this exile. It's no surprise that you're in this situation. Because they had sinned against God. Now, I'm not saying when a difficult circumstance comes into our life that it's always because of sin. Don't, don't think that. We know from the life of Job, for example, Job is a righteous man, but yet these things uh, came into Job's life as well. He uh, undergone great trials as well, not because of any sin of his own. But sometimes God can bring circumstances into our life to, to even seek to correct us. And actually, Jeremiah is writing this letter to say to them, this was no accident and this was no surprise to God because God had caused this accident. God had permitted them to, the Babylonians to do this. And far from saying, get ready, get your bags packed because in a couple of years' time, you're coming back. Jeremiah actually had a very different message for them. Look at verses five onwards to see what this message was. He says, build houses and live in them. Now, Think about that. If you had just gone to a place you didn't want to be, would you be saying, let's build a nice house, let's plant a lovely garden? No, you wouldn't. But yet Jeremiah is saying, you know, make yourself at home. Build houses, live in them, plant gardens for yourself, verse 5. And, and you know, don't think that when they were in exile that this was some concentration camp. It wasn't. The people had actually homes. They were working for Babylon. Yes, they were. They would have had to even labor uh, for Babylon as well. But they were able to build their own homes. And actually, the Babylonians allowed them even to keep things like the Sabbath day uh, as well too. So they were afforded some measure of freedom. But yet we see from the scriptures and we see from other passages in the Psalms that they didn't want to be in Babylon. But this is where God had them. For a good reason, and we'll see why later. The Lord told him, verse 6, start families. And again, Hananiah was saying, oh, no, sure, it'll be all right. You know, in a couple of years, you'll be back. And Jeremiah is saying, no, you make your home here. Build your home. Have families as well, too. Settle in the land. Because they're going to be there for 70 years. He says, marry among, marry among your people. In order that during that time, your people won't actually decrease, but actually you'll increase. This will be the means of Israel actually getting bigger and stronger. Not only that, but he told them, seek the good of the city where you're in exile. Verse 7. You know, they didn't really, I'm sure, want to seek the good of this strange city where they were in this foreign city. But yet, Jeremiah was saying, you pray for this place where you are. Because this is where you are. And this is where you're going to be for a while. So pray for the good of this city in order that you can prosper. And so the Lord was saying, don't listen to those false prophets or their dreams, but listen to the voice of God. Listen to me, he's saying here. So the Lord says, it's only when these 70 years have been completed, verse 10, that I will visit you and fulfill my promise to bring you back. So this, what we've seen so far, is this was a specific promise to a specific group of people. Now, the you here is plural. I want you to see in this promise itself. And how do I know that? Well, you know it in the original language, but also, you know, maybe you're thinking, how do I know that? How can you prove that, Neil? Well, verse 14, where the Lord says, I will be found by you. I'll restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations. It's clear the you there isn't talking to one individual. One individual wasn't scattered among the nations. No, this is talking about a group of people. 
So this is a, a promise addressed to Israel, a specific group of people, a specific time. But if this was a promise given to a specific people, does the promise have something to say to us? Yes, it does. I don't want you to be going home and, and taking down that Jeremiah 29 uh, verse 11 picture maybe that you have in your house because I'm sure maybe some of you maybe even have a text of that somewhere uh, in the house maybe as well. But no, this promise does have something to say to us. But in order for us to rightly understand it, it's important for us to ask ourselves, what did it mean to the original people who heard this? So what did the promise mean for Israel firstly? The promise was, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. What did this promise mean to them? The promise firstly brought them comfort and reassurance. You see, in giving that promise, God was showing Israel, I'm not done with you yet. Though they were maybe feeling afar off, this was showing them that actually God had plans for these people. He, hadn't, he wasn't going to cast them off forever. Not at all. He had a future for them. And these plans, actually, they weren't plans for evil. They were plans for their own good. Because they were going through that trial as it was God's judgment for their sin. But actually, God in his grace and mercy was going to do a greater work through that trial. In fact, as bringing them into this time of judgment, look at actually the work that he was going to do within their hearts. And we see what this work was in verse 12. See, the more time they spent in Jerusalem, you know, they were, this was going to be the means of even them bringing, bringing them back to God. Because it was going to humble them. They were a people before who were proud. They were filled with pride. They thought we can go things our own way and do things how we like. But yet God was showing them and God was teaching them who is the one who truly is in control. He would brought them to that land so they could reflect on the sin that they'd committed. And as a result of this, there would be a faithful remnant of people. And they would cry out to God in prayer. And unlike the previous time where they had gone to temple and tried to, to worship the Lord, it wasn't just about the externals. Because look at verse 13. There will be a time when you'll seek me and you'll find me, when you seek me with all your heart. Before they hadn't been seeking the Lord with all their heart. They'd only be just going through the motions. But here now... God was going to use those 70 years to bring these people low in order that they would cry out to him again with a true heart. These would be plans for their spiritual welfare, but also for their physical welfare. Because as I say, during this time, Israel was going to grow. He was telling them, make homes. You know, have families. And they were going to come out of this place even a stronger people. The, the, the word used in welfare in verse 11 is actually translated in various ways and, and depending on what translation you're reading from, I'm reading from the English Standard Version here, but in the NIV it says it's plans to prosper and the authorized it used the word peace and the ESV has that in a little uh, footnote as well too. And that's because the Hebrew word behind this is the word shalom. It is a peace. And it's not talking about an absence of conflict, but it's talking about a sense of whole, wholeness, a sense of even well-being. God's plans are to, to bless these people, to bless them. See, how this gave them comfort and reassurance to a people who felt forgotten, to a people who were maybe beginning to question God, this was reminding them that God still does love them. See, God's love was steadfast. God's love was steadfast, it was unchanging. And even though these people, their love for God had grown cold, he still loved them. And even in his judgment, he was displaying this love. But it also taught them about God's sovereignty. You see, their plans and their ideas might have been very different than the plan God had. These people wanted to believe so much that prophecy of Hananiah. You know, that they'd be out of this place in two years. But yet that was not the way to be. Because God was in control. They were in exile, and this was God's will for his people, and they'd only be returned whenever God decreed it. You know, God's plan for their lives was different than they could have imagined. They maybe would have chosen any other path other than this. 
And maybe sometimes that's your own experience in life. Maybe you've sometimes struggled with the, the will of God. You know, we can't always see the, the, the big picture. Corrie ten Boom always used to use the illustration of a tapestry in life. If you've ever looked at a tapestry from the other side, all you see is something like it. To be honest, it looks a bit of a, a mess because there's, there's all these different bits of thread and, and so on on the other side. And there's a whole mixture of colors. And sometimes we only look, she recalls as a child how she used to sit at her grandmother, uh, grandmother's feet and she used to look up and all she would see was the, the, the little tapestry from the other side. And she would see the, the tangles of thread and she would think, what is that? And sometimes maybe that's the way we feel about some circumstances that come into our life. We are wondering, Lord, why has this happened? What's going on here? But when you look at the tapestry from on the other side, what do you see? You see a beautiful picture. You know, in many ways, we are looking at only a small part of the picture, aren't we? We are maybe looking at it from, we can't see the whole big picture, but our God does. And God was in many ways revealing some of that picture to these people here. He was reminding them, I'm in control. And, you know, we've seen in Ezra and Nehemiah, they couldn't imagine how they were going to get out of that place. But how God does move in mysterious ways. He used an ungodly king to actually bring them back to the land. Not only bring them back to the land, even to provide for the rebuilding of the city. Imagine that. To provide for the rebuilding of the city. Isaiah 55, 8 to 9 says, you know, God's ways are, as high as the heavens are, uh, uh, sorry, God's thoughts are not like our thoughts. God's ways are not like our ways. But the heavens, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. We have an all-knowing God, an all-powerful God. It's hard for us with our finite minds you know, we don't often understand the full picture of why things happen in our world. One day when we get the glory, praise God, we will understand. You know, the Lord was reminding them. It was teaching them about God's sovereignty. But it gave them a hope. And in verses 11, it says, these are plans to give you a future and a hope. And these words are literally, uh, in the original language, it's, it's literally saying to give you an end and a hope. In Hebrew, it's a figure of a speech, actually, where two related words are, are used to communicate a single idea so, and heighten the meaning. So, for example, uh, the phrase signs and wonders. It's talking about one thing, really, there, but it's to heighten the meaning. So here, the prophet's communicating, you have a hopeful end. You have a hopeful end. God has not finished with you yet. God is still doing a work in your life. And that future is expanded in verses 12 to 14. Because they would be humbled. They were going to be humbled and it wasn't going to be a pleasant experience. They were going to repent of their sin. And God is going to look in them in gracious favor. But already there was mercy he was showing them in the judgment. Because he was causing this for their good. Look at verse 14. He would turn to them again and he would reveal himself to them again. And not only that, but he would restore them. He would gather them in for the nations. And he would bring them back. God's going to do this. God was going to do this. But this would only happen in God's way and in God's time. The suffering that they had gone through was going to be necessary in order that they would truly be his people again. Because through this experience, he was actually sanctifying them. He was sanctifying his people, preparing them for what they should have been in the first place. And in order for that to take place, they had to go through refining. But this was a promise, you see, then for a group of people, for Israel. But what does the promise mean for us, lastly? What does it mean for us? I want to just draw two things out of this. It teaches us to trust God at all times. Not just at all times, and in all seasons of life, God's plans are for our good. And as I say, this promise doesn't guarantee us health, wealth, and happiness. It does remind us that sometimes we must go through difficult periods. But we must remember God can do a greater work, even though we can know or understand even through that. There are times where God may discipline us in our life through certain things. 
there are instances even where sometimes we've maybe relied on, on maybe false sources of strength in our life. Maybe even in our, our health as well. You know, you often take your, your health for granted until it's, it's taken away from you. You know, maybe for some of us that's maybe been a, a false source of, um, of, of hope in our life. You know, we've maybe relied on our own strength. And sometimes God has taken that away and reminded us we need to rely on him. We need to rely on him more. There's times even when we go through, like these people, even spiritual dry spells. But even experiences such as this can, can even increase our, our longing for God, our hunger for God. To make us cry out to him even greater than we did before. And that's what was happening in these people's lives. There'd be a time when they were going to cry out to God. Because they began to realize the seriousness of their sin. They realized their situation they were in was because of, it was a situation of their own making in this case. But it reminds us that God's plans are not like ours. Sometimes when we pray for something, we perhaps come to God with our plan and our ideas of how something's going to work out. But yet God has other ideas. In this case, it was for his people to be in Babylon for 70 years. Sometimes God does call us to walk a difficult path. But he does so in order to sanctify us, in order to prepare us for heaven. Do you know the name George Mueller is well known? He's a man of, of prayer and faith. I love the, some of the stories of the, the life of George Mueller. And you'll have often heard, I'm sure, the stories of how Mueller prayed with great confidence for supplies in his orphanage. And then how at the exact moment often those supplies did come along. He was a man of prayer, a man of faith. But I heard of a story a little while ago when his wife had become ill with rheumatic fever. And here's what Mueller prayed. He said, Yes, my father, the times of my darling wife are in thy hands. Thou wilt do the very best thing for her and for me, whether life or death. If it may be, raise up yet again my precious wife. Thou art able to do it, though she is so ill. But however you deal with me, only help me to continue to be perfectly satisfied with thy holy will. That takes a lot to say those verses. Say that, doesn't it? His wife died, actually, after that circumstance. And a Mueller actually preached at her funeral sermon from Psalm 119, verse 68. And that verse says... Thou art good and doest good. That's a prayer of someone who has faith in God. And even when faith is tested, even when those clouds are dark in our life, and we will experience dark times, but God is still there in those times. God has not left us. God is there. Whether we feel that or not, how do I know God is still there? Because his word shows us time and time again he won't forsake his people he is a rock he is a refuge God is still there and God still cares and though the clouds sometimes may gather in our lives you know and though the clouds may gather during the day we know that the sun still shines behind it we know even that the sun will break through those clouds again you know, these people needed to realize that, didn't they? And so do we as well. We need to trust God, to believe that he hasn't forsaken us, to know that he had these people exactly where they needed to be. You know, thinking of even the story of Joseph. Joseph, I'm reminded of those famous words that he said to his brothers when they came to Egypt. And consider what happened to Joseph. He was a man who found himself in Egypt, he found himself in a prison cell. But yet, here's the thing about the life of Joseph. You see, in each of those circumstances, notice there's a little phrase when you read the life of Joseph. It says that basically God was with him. Whether he was in prison, whether he was in the pit, God was with him. And God was with him so much, he knew that Joseph could see. He couldn't see it, I'm sure, at the time when he was in the pit or initially when he went to Egypt. But when his brothers came back to him. Here's what he said. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about as it was this day to save many people alive. God had him in that position 
in order to even provide for his brothers, in order to even that the, the people, the children of Israel would even survive, God had him there in that position. And you know, it's no accident where God has placed you in life, whether that be in the street where you are, the street where you live, whether that be in the, the workplace where you are, God has placed you there. And God can use you there even to be the means to witness to someone. God can use even your life as a, as a living a testimony, as a living word to others. It may not always be easy, the path we're called to walk, but God puts in our path what is necessary to make us even who we need to be in Christ, to sanctify us. But here's something else, the last thing we're going to look at. It reminds us of our glorious future in Christ. And we, like these people, have a glorious future. And you know what? I've used the illustration of the mountain. Going up the mountain is never easy. If you ever go on hiking, and I remember one, one particular difficult experience in the Catbell Mountains with a friend of mine, and I have to admit, you know, the thing I was hoping for at the top of that mountain was an oxygen tent or something, because I was, I was suffering, let me tell you, as I was climbing up it. But when you got it, you looked across the whole, I think it was Lake Windermere you looked across to, and once you got there, the journey was worth it all. It was worth it all when you seen that sight, when you seen the beauty. And so too, God has a glorious future for us. Do you know, we often define our future in our terms, like uh, we think of in terms of our health or our will for our family, we define the future in, in our terms. But God was defining a glorious future for these people. And it was glorious. He was showing them a bigger picture. You know, we have a glorious future, but God was calling these people to trust in him. And he calls us to do the same thing while we make that journey as well. And what is that glorious future? Well, turn with me to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. We get a glimpse of this glorious future even here. See, in Ephesians 1, it's, it's the spiritual blessings we have in Christ. And the, the, here Paul is just, he's bubbling over with great joy of all that the Lord has done for him. Ephesians 1 verse 4 and 5. I'm going to mention these briefly because we're running out of time here now. But verses 4 to 5. This is a plan which God has from eternity. Before the world was even formed, he had this plan that we would be holy and blameless before him. Look down to verse 7. Another part of this plan was that we would be redeemed through the precious blood of Christ. That we'd be forgiven from our sins because of God's grace. That was part of the plan. Verses 9 to 11. God made his, known his will and his purpose in Christ that sinners would be reconciled to God according to that purpose. And he says we've obtained an inheritance. An inheritance that all the blessings of salvation and in this, you could preach in that verse alone about the inheritance that God has prepared for us. And don't worry, I know time's going on and, and probably the, if the dinner's going on, it's not going to be burnt, don't worry. But the blessings that we have, even the, the blessing of salvation, even the future of, of eternal life with our God, in the presence of God, in a place that is perfect, a place where there is no more sickness, a place where there is no more death, place where there's no more crying. Isn't that glorious? Don't we have a glorious future? You see, in Christ, we have a glorious future that's going to make all the disappointments, all the sorrows in this world. One day we'll be able to stand there in glory and we'll be able to go, do you know what? The journey was worth it all. The journey was worth it all. So as we close today, you know, you see that Maybe this promise isn't what you, you, you quite at first thought. Because it, while it's not directly addressed to us, but we can learn a lot from this promise. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have something to say to us today. It does. It does bring us comfort. God has plans for our good. And he, he knows that good better than we know even as well. But he is still a God of grace. 
one who will hear and forgive when we turn to him with all our heart. And praise God, he's not one who's going to turn us away. One who in his grace can restore the sinner once again. God wanted to call his people to trust in him. To trust in him and why they're there. Why, and we're kind of like those exiles at the minute because we're living in a land. We are bound for an eternal home if you're in Christ. But we are living in, a, in many ways in a foreign land here now. And we're to pray for the good of the land. But don't lose sight of the glorious future that God has for your life. Don't lose sight of the blessed hope. Do you know, sometimes, I don't know about you, when you, you switch the news on, you know, you're, you're kind of despairing, aren't you? And sometimes when you hear the latest headline, if it's not COVID, the next thing, there's, there's monkey pox and Emma still can't watch that. Well, I don't know why they show the pictures during tea time, but, um, you know, they, they have all these things and we look around and go, you know, if, we, if that's all we were taking in, we'd be going, where is the hope? We'd be getting depressed, wouldn't we? But look to the future. Look to what God has prepared for us. We have a glorious hope in Christ. And so let us not lose sight of that hope. Let us cling to it today. But let us be living for God, even until we reach that place. We're going to sing together in a a short moment. What I'll do is I'll pray first, and then we're going to sing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this glorious promise, which does have something to say to us. It does remind us of your sovereignty. It reminds us, Lord, that you are in control. And and Father, sometimes we struggle with that in our life. Maybe if our life has taken a turn that we, we wish it hadn't have taken, Lord. We've gone through painful experiences. But yet, Father, we know that if we're in Christ Jesus... You can even use those difficult experiences to to make us even rely on you more, to make us cling to you, to call out to you. But Father, you have a glorious future prepared for us. If we're in Christ Jesus, that future's secure. And Father Peter even says, Lord, not only do you have that inheritance reserved for us, but Father, you keep us by your power till that day. And so, Lord, from this promise, encourage us from it, Lord. May we know that we have a glorious future. But Father, help us until that day to depend on you, to rely on you, and to seek your face. And so, Lord, bless us and help us. And we do want to give thanks for your grace. It is grace which leads the sinner home. And so help us now as we come around the table. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are going to sing uh, this piece, which is entitled Grace. We have a gracious God. This passage reminded us of God's grace, how God was even doing this in Israel's life to even restore them. And so it is grace which leads the sinner home. Let's stand to change your positions as we sing this, please. Oh. 
Turn your Bibles to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. As I thought of that verse this morning in, in Jeremiah and about how it talks about the will and the plan of God and how sometimes that will for our greater good may involve even suffering and trial. As I thought around the table, I was reminded of, of these verses in Isaiah 53, verses 10 to 12 of this passage, please. And in verse 10 it says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall a righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. We know, of course, that this passage, it speaks of the song, it's the song of the suffering servant, And it describes how God's Messiah was going to be despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, the one who it says would bear our griefs and carry our sorrows. He'd be crushed even for our transgressions, pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Yet in verse 10, it declares that this was the will of God, that he would be crushed and put to grief, reminding us that he didn't just suffer in his body, He suffered in the very depths of his being. Yet this verse shows us the purpose of this suffering. In the giving of his life, in the giving of his soul, he made an offering for our guilt. The sinless one had our guilt laid upon him and was punished in our place. Yet this verse also, these verses we've read, declares a glorious future as well too. Because the grave will not be the end for him. He shall see his offspring and prolong his days. The song describes us as being like sheep who have gone astray. But actually those sheep will, those, there will be, he will bring some of those sheep back even to him as well as his children. And he, as he rises again, he, will, he won't just have the joy of seeing those sinners return to God, but also this servant will one day ruin and reign. One day the suffering servant will ruin and reign. And through his suffering, many will be accounted righteous. We are those who have benefited, aren't we, from our Savior's suffering. He suffered for us. He suffered for us in order to bring us to God. And because of that suffering that he endured on our behalf, we do have a glorious future. F.B. Meyer writes of this verse, Jesus shall one day be satisfied and the glory that shall go to the Father, and the redemption of untold multitudes, and the character of the redeemed, even in the destruction of the results of the fall, we shall hear his sigh of content 
and see the triumph on his face. We shall witness even the transference of his kingdom to the Father. If he is satisfied, so will we be. If he is satisfied, so will we be. Around this table, we consider the Savior's suffering. We think of it. We give thanks for it. We remember it. And we remember it because this is by the means at which we approach this table. It's not because of any merit of our own. It's all because of God's saving grace. Let me read the passage once more from 1 Corinthians and then our brothers are going to give thanks for the emblems. The Lord Jesus in the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for being able to gather around the table this morning. We thank you that we've been reminded that it pleased the Lord to bruise him and our minds can hardly take that in. The Son of God gave his life for each one of us. And as we take the bread this morning, we want to thank you, dear Father, for so great salvation. We thank you for forgiving us for our sins and for your mercy and your grace each day. In our Savior's name. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity again to meet around your table. And we thank you, think of that verse, Lord, that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And how our Saviour, Lord, was bruised, not for anything that he'd done wrong himself, but for my sins, for the sins of the world. And we thank you, Lord, that when he took the punishment for our sins. It was a once and for all sacrifice. And we thank you, Lord, that even now, the Savior, having shed his precious blood, sits at your right hand in glory, interceding for us. So, Lord, as we take up this cup, which reminds us of that precious shed blood, accept our thanks again, in Jesus' name.
Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks that you are a sovereign God. And we give thanks, Lord, for your great plan of salvation, your great plan of redemption, centered on the person and work of Christ upon the cross, that he came and lived that perfect life, that he died as an atonement even for our sin and was raised even for our justification too. Father, we want to give you thanks even that sinners are reconciled to you. Father, that you not only save us, but you keep us as well and you sanctify us. You sanctify us, Lord, even fitting us for heaven as well too. Lord, doing this work in our hearts. And Father, we want to give thanks even for the presence of your Holy Spirit within us to give us that strength that we need to to even encourage us from your word. And so, Lord, help us as we seek to live for you. Lord, help us even tonight as our brother John Cunningham even comes to to share his testimony uh, with us as well. We do pray for that. We pray for all those who have been invited. Lord, work in their hearts as well. And Father, as we hear even of your saving grace in his life. Father, be glorified. And be glorified in us today. In Jesus' name. Amen.